great. Great. Well, I'm particularly excited to be here. Um, I think like many of you here, uh, my love of natural history actually began on Long Island. I'd be curious actually to see how many, how many of you is that true for, that you, your love of natural history came in Long Island. Good. And what about, did it start as a child? How many of you did it start as a child? Yeah, look around the room. That is amazing. For me, actually, um, it did not start as a child. I grew up in Jamaica, Queens with no context for the natural world. Um, so much so that when my folks moved to Long Island when I was about 15, um, we petitioned the town to put street lights up because we thought that's why people didn't hang out on their stoop or on their porch um, and thought that we should pave over a, uh, uh, an empty lot, uh, which was actually a recharge basin, um, to put in a handball court because we thought that's why people we're, in, we're in, out in the community. So an example of, of good intentions, but, but completely out of context and out of touch with, with the natural world. So in my um, teenage angst and misery of having moved to you know, the middle of nowhere um, in Huntington, um, I, <laughs> I started to uh, take lonely walks at places like Sunken Meadow and Comset and uh, Robert Moses, and then everything changed. And like a typical teenager, um, it changed for the extreme. Um, and I decided to stop wearing shoes. And uh, my idea of a wild Friday night was to get stuck on a sandbar at high tide. Um, so my parents had a whole set of unexpected teenage rebellion uh, experiences on their hands. Um, and that led me to go out west for college and seeking wilderness. And sort of in, in again, that kind of extreme state, you know, think that the human built environment, you know, even the, the forests that I learned to love nature weren't, weren't enough. They weren't wilderness. And really in the end, though I got a great ecological education and spent lots of time in the backcountry, I was really contributing to that sort of dichotomy of you know, wilderness versus human-built environment, or you know, ecology, uh, pristine versus um, tarnished. And, um, and actually, that's, that's the space where nothing gets done, right? Nothing gets done in dichotomy. Things get done in integration. And uh, like that great visual that, that Tom had up on the, the deer slide, the so social ecological systems. Um, so enter community science, or citizen science, or public participation in scientific research, or crowdsource science. There's tons of terms uh, popping up for, for this idea of um, scientific research conducted um, by uh, non-professionals, or amateurs, which is a word that drives me nuts, because um, Really, the best naturalists I know are, are the non-professional ones. I mean, there's great, obviously, great professional naturalists out there, too. But um, so this is a really incredibly burgeoning field right now. Um, and there's tons of us out there. So how many of you have done some sort of um, citizen science before, contributed data, to, yeah, look at that, tons of folks. You know, there's national programs, local programs. Um, you know, they range all across disciplines. Um, lots of ecology, lots of uh, biology, astronomy, and so forth. Tons of serious science going on. Um, I was just at the, uh, the first annual Citizen Science Association conference in San Jose. Um, there's also a brand new journal um, and at this conference, uh, there were just the most amazing descriptions of, of projects out there. Um, you know, new ones popping up all the time. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's really quite, quite innovative. So, you know, from invasive species ID, um, you know, inventorying, mapping risk, all of these, I mean, in genetics, um, you know, using gamers to, to um, fold proteins. I mean, it's, it's really, it's off the charts right now. And, uh, and there's even some websites that you can use, such as um, sitsci.org. Well, SciStarter is one, 
Um, that's this one right over here. You can look it up. Um, they, uh, is, it's a catalog to get volunteers to get a, together with the projects that are actually out there. So it's, it's trying to you know, make sure that if you are interested, there, you, you have a really easy place to go to find the project that, that suits your interests. Um, and sitsci.org, you can actually create your own citizen science project. There's um, ways to create databases and, and all of that. So incredible amount of tools out there. Um, and it's just really proliferating left and right. Why? Why now? You know, citizen science is not a brand new, ter brand new concept. It's been around for, for quite a while. Uh, there's a lot of programs that have been going on for, uh, for, for a really long time, you know, the Great Backyard Bird Count, Christmas Bird Counts, all of these type of things that many of you have been involved with. But now it's seeing this exponential growth. Why? I think this is the big, <laughs> one of the big reasons. It's even made it into Maslow's hierarchy of, of basic human needs. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, mobile technology, apps. I, need, I know it sounds very simple, but, um, you know, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's part of why I'm doing it, you know? I've got my, my nerdy assortment of, of all of my citizen science apps on my phone, and when I hike and when I'm out, you know, I can upload data right there. Don't have to go home, I don't have to deal with, you know, data sheets, that extra step is sort of taken away. And I think that's, that gets a lot of people involved. Um, also, extreme weather boogeyman has come to town. And, uh, you know, basically, we're in the Anthropocene, right? And, and I think people are actually starting to get kind of scared. <laughs> um, and I do think also there is the basic human nature of wanting to contribute. Um, I know there's, you know, a lot of people out there that don't care and, and all of that, but I think for the most part, people really want to contribute. And when they know that they're doing something, when they're engaged in something that's authentic and contributing to real science, it makes a huge difference. So, data and education. We can actually do this at the same time, both really well. Um, I think a lot of the times, you know, I'm sure you've heard your high school students or kids say, you know, I don't know why we're doing this thing, it doesn't matter, and all that. Well, when you set a context that, that provides that sense of, of real engagement uh, and authenticity, you know, that, that's really a space where people learn. Um, and then, of course, you know, as, as, as we all know, there's way too much data out there to collect, and scientists just can't do it. Um, so, so we really need community science, and we really need collaboration. Again, thinking about that great visual, um, that's really where stuff happens, is, in, is, is across agencies and across <coughs> communities. And in fact, that's why I, I like the term community science more than citizen science, because I think that, that aspect of, of communities coming together, um, you know, not just people sort of in their own backyards, counting or sorting or collecting, but actually that um, networked uh, initiatives that, that provide uh, collaboration. So we're going to talk about um, a, couple of, a couple of tools or opportunities or ideas that uh, I've found fairly easy to implement um, that seem to uh, have that capacity to scale um, and, and be implemented by a variety of agencies and organizations, which I think is an important aspect of, a, of an initiative's success. I mean, we can want to, you know, uh, clean the water and do all these things, but those type of things are hard to do, right? You have to have a certain amount of training and all that. So these are just some tools and techniques. Um, they're just ideas, and I'm really curious to see um, you know, where, where Long Island is at in, in regards to, you know, taking on some of these initiatives. Um, so so we'll, we'll get mostly into phenology trails and phenology monitoring, but I also want to start with pollinator gardens because um, this is a, a habitat implementation type of technique that can be done on a really small scale. So for those of you who are school teachers or, you know, homeowners, 
or um, you know, organizations or agencies that even have a little plot of land in the front um, of, your, of your building. This is the type of thing you can actually uh, put in, get certified um, you know, as, a back, as a backyard habitat or a schoolyard habitat with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, and you can tag it into tons of citizen science programs out there. So if you have patches of milkweed, you can tag into Monarch Watch. You know, there are these opportunities to really hook into um, a lot of new citizen science programs. Bumblebee Watch through Xerces is a new one that, that can be easily done with even just a small habitat patch or a garden. Um, it's a great way to, to get communities involved in, in planting and, and all of that. Um, it can be done in you know, even highly urban areas. I've worked with a lot of teachers in New York City to, to build these even in just container gardens um, you know, on their rooftop or, or outside their school. Um, so it's, it's a fairly easy thing to, to implement. And it could be replicated, connected. If you come up with the right species list, um, you can use it across uh, across regions. So this is one of the things that we're doing with the New York Phenology Project. And really, you know, all you need, I'm sure you've seen, you know, a lot of you are familiar with this, so I won't go on too long about it, but just need really flower-rich foraging areas um, and, and suitable places for, um, for nests and for, for larva uh, to, to lay, the, uh, for um, larva and eggs, you know, no pesticides. And then another really great um, sort of artistic addition are these uh, native bee hotels. How many people have seen these before? They are just so cool. Um, my first trip to Paris uh, a couple of years ago, um, Paris is doing amazing things in the sort of green infrastructure world. Um, but instead of going to the Louvre or you know having a glass of wine at a cafe, I went right to this amazing bee hotel at, at a park. And it's just... So beautiful and incredible. Um, so these are really fun uh, activities you can do with, with students and, um, and teachers and all of that. It's super fun. Um, meet a lot of you know, the next generation science standards uh, and so forth. And um, to develop thematic curriculum, monitor pollinator populations, and then also hook into this tracking phenology for both the plants and pollinators that you're watching. So let's make sure we're all on the same page with, uh, with the word phenology. Notice I'm not saying phrenology. <laughs> I have had a couple of really awkward experiences where I've spoken to people about my PhD research and they have this look of, oh, this poor woman, she just, doesn't know that she's getting a degree in an outdated 19th century <laughs> pseudoscience about skull bumps. That is not what we're talking about. <laughs> we are talking about phenology. The root is pheno, which means to appear or to bring to light, like phenomenon. Um, and, it's, and it refers to the timing of life cycle events in the natural world. Uh, in the plant world, that would be uh, budding, flowering, fruiting, in the animal world, examples would be migration, egg laying, hatching, so forth. The phenophase is the span of time in which this life history event occurs. Um, so when you are, when a plant is flowering, it is in the flowering phenophase and then would enter into you know, the fruiting phenophase after that if it gets pollinated. Um, and it uh, is dependent on both internal or endogenous or external factors. So internal factors would be genetics, age, so forth. External factors would be photo period or the length of night and day and temperature. Uh, it's relevant because it is one of the main quantifiable indicators of climate change. Uh, obviously, you know, our food is highly impacted. Um, you know, what happens when, we're, when the crops grow too early and then there's a spring frost? That is problematic. Um, this word asynchronization, so uh, the timing getting out of whack between organisms who are dependent on each other, such as um, uh, you know, the monarch and the milkweed, uh, that type of interaction that's got a highly dependent relationship. Um, and then also the carbon cycle is, is um, highly impacted by the length of the growing season. And, and there's synergistic effects that, that we don't quite know how to track in terms of how changing um, phenology is going to impact the carbon cycle. 
So we've got a lot of evidence of changes. Uh, it's about, the average is, simple average is about two days per decade of earlier um, uh, phenology. 78% of all records are advancing according to some big meta-analyses. Uh, range shifts is about six kilometers per decade. Um, and this is all due to increased temperature, elevated CO2, um, urban heat island effect. Um, that's where you see these type of things the most. There are some examples, demonstrated examples of asynchrony. Um, this was a, a nature paper, paper from a study from the Netherlands where um, you know, the oak did come out earlier and the moth that ate the oak leaves came out earlier, um, but the pied flycatcher came at the same time, um, responding more to photo period than temperature and 80% uh, of the population uh, declined. Uh, so that was a, that was a pretty um, intense example of this asynchronization. In terms of uh, plants and pollinators, sort of mixed evidence. There's some um, you know, de demonstrable evidence of this mismatch, although uh, some you know, meta-analyses show that in highly diverse um, ecosystems, there's enough buffer because there are enough generalist plants and pollinators, um, particularly plants, have a little bit more um, of, a, of a resiliency with the loss of pollinator because they can tend to be pollinated by more than one thing, right? But there are a lot of pollinators that, you know, the length of their tongue is, prohibits them from reaching uh, particular nectar that they need, so, so they can have a more highly dependent relationship. But there are ex tons of examples of these really specialist relationships, you know, yucca and yucca moths and so forth. Um, and so, Really, we don't know uh, the breadth of the impact on uh, this asynchronization between plants and pollinators, and we really need eyes on the ground or boots on the ground um, to, to really start to get a sense um, from that local scale and across regions um, how, whether plants and pollinators are really tracking each other. Um, because as you know, right, pollinators are in, are, are in big trouble as it is through, through, for reasons not just related to climate change, but you know, pesticides and um, loss of habitat and, and all of these things compound. Um, but we, we need some more eyes on the ground. So thankfully there's this great history, um, particularly with phenology of naturalists. You know, when you think of sort of the old school naturalist, which many of us in here are, right? You know, we're out there with our journals and these journals, and these old records are, are part of how we know what the biological response to climate change has been. So, you know, there are actual records that are thousands of years old, farming records from China. Um, the the cherry unbroken cherry blossom record in Japan is 1,200 years old. In France, the grape harvest record, unbroken, 670 years old. I mean, we have old records where you can see these trends like that. Um, and, you know, in North America, unfortunately, you know, not, not so much. Um, but we do have some great examples of, of folks who kept really great records. And people have gone, academics have gone back to these records and published some papers. You know, there was particularly some great papers on uh, going back to Thoreau's data. Daniel Smiley was up at, up at Mohonk. Preserve, um, which is one of the sites in the network that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, so these observations, pheno monitoring phenology, you know, writing the date when you see something in bloom, you know, these type of things are really amenable to, um, to citizen scientists or community scientists. Um, and when I was uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, working on a PhD, I wanted to track uh, phenology, you know, spatial and, con and temporal connectivity of plants and pollinators across from a city to a, a, a wild gradient, urban to wild gradient. And I knew I couldn't do this myself and wanted to engage uh, commu the community in this effort. Um, but before I did that, uh, I wanted to make sure that these type of observations and the protocols that were out there were actually valid. So I got together uh, this group of people, the original intent was to track uh, this accuracy 
Um, but it ended up turning into this vibrant network um, and this community building experience that just totally blew my mind um, and, and really sort of reset the course of my, of my academic career. Um, but basically what this study was, was I established a phenology trail. So I marked plants along a trail and I got 28 citizen scientists together to track um, with these tag plants to track phenophases across 16 weeks. We collected about 14,000 observations. And when I ran the analysis to see how consistent the data was, right, it was compared to my baseline data as the expert. Um, uh, and then I tracked the consistency across observers. And I got this 91% number. And I thought, this just cannot be right. That is too high. I mean, you know, you've seen studies out there looking at like the accuracy of, you know, grad students in the field and it's not that high. So I thought, okay, something's wrong. When I dug into it a little bit more and really went to the fine scale, I did notice that the accuracy dropped a little bit um, for the days where uh, the phenophase were just shifting from one to another. So when the leaf was not quite unfolded yet, um, and so forth. So the accuracy dropped a little, but all total, if you were to take that all together, you know, from all the repeat observations that kind of bumped up this number to that accuracy rate, it's pretty darn accurate. Um, and I felt confident, uh, or confident that um, we could use this for a, for a larger study. Um, the less experienced observers, so the people who, you know, just sort of dipped in for a few weeks, their accuracy rate was not very different than the people who were out there, you know, regularly every day. So that bodes well for a project where, you know, you know you're not going to need to highly train your volunteers, that they, need, they have to be out there, you know, every other day or every day, um, that they can touch in once or twice a week and still make up a really great contribution. Um, the species and phenophases did vary. Um, some were harder than others. Um, and this allowed us to go back to the National Phenology Network, which was the protocols we decided to use, and give them uh, an idea of, of how to alter the protocols to improve them. So this was years ago. Since then, um, a lot has, has happened. And this uh, National Phenology Network, um, as one example, there's a couple of, there's, there's also Project Budburst, but National Phenology Network has gotten a lot of citizen scientists together. And in the early days, the model was this backyard, you know, people in their yards tagging their plants um, and making this big, broad data set. But, but the interesting thing happened was that people started to form these communities. Now, uh, you know, the one that I sort of put together just to do this accuracy study, you know, became this vibrant monitoring community that still exists now and is contributing hundreds of thousands of, of observations. Um, and that's what kept happening, is that these sort of geographic affiliates, is what they started to call them, started just popping up through um, academic research institutions, community gardens, master naturalist programs, all of these type of things. And so now the National Phenology Network is really having to put a lot more resources into providing um, the kind of resources that now these geographic affiliates need to launch these uh, networks of observers as opposed to individual observers. So it's scaled, basically. For those of you in the business and corporate world, you know, this is an example of, of sort of a self-scaling uh, initiative, which, which is pretty amazing. So basically, um, when I came to New York, I, I, I got a job offer in New York, and I, I left my, my research behind um, and came to New York and thought, you know, looked around, didn't see a monitoring network and thought, you know, over time, slowly, I'd like to, to start mo doing some monitoring in New York. Um, should I fix that? <laughs> you want to fix that for me? OK. So um, boy, that looks like a really ominous countdown. Um, so what ended up happening was I had the good fortune of uh, meeting uh, a bunch of other uh, organizations in the Hudson Valley. I moved to the Catskills. And folks got together. It's an organization called EMMA, Ecological uh, Monitoring and Management Alliance. And it was uh, folks who headed you know, agencies or ran nature preserves. And we got together. We talked about various ideas. I told them about the project in Portland. And instantly, we had scale. 
just by kind of getting together, you know, really collaborating on an effort, saying what is important to us. You know, we want to address climate change. We want a project that it meets both education goals um, and monitoring goals that contributes to a national data set. You know, boom, presented this project, had this support from organizations, and everyone launched their own phenology trail project with the same species list. And it ended up on a gradient basically from New York City. Um, it's now the southernmost uh, end is the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. Um, all the way up now to the Adirondacks with the uh, Intervale Lowlands Nature Preserve is our northernmost site. Most sites are you know, still concentrated more in the kind of Hudson Valley uh, region because of the sort of support of this collaborative network of, of, of agencies. Um, but we're starting to, uh, to populate uh, more and more organizations for this, this common purpose. And the point is to track plants and pollinators. So we all established phenology trail, tagged a similar suite of species. Obviously, not every place has every species. So there's overlapping species. Um, and the next phase is to bring in the, the pollinator monitoring protocol. But the first phase, you know, got the trails on the ground. School groups have started to interact. Teacher professional development workshops. Uh, this is a list of our, our current sites, uh, one of which includes um, a Zen monastery. Interestingly enough, lots of very different communities of observers are sort of popping up to, to participate in this. So it's the kind of thing that doesn't even have to be just um, focused on um, nature preserves. Um, our numbers just for 2014 were over 100,000 observations, 150 registered observers, um, you know, college students, you know, some staff as well. So it's this really, uh, it's a community effort. Again, not to hit that point too hard, but you know, it's not just the citizen scientists out there. It's actually the staff and interns and teachers in the community and the volunteers all uh, doing the same monitoring. Um, so it's had pretty, pretty fast success um, in just really a couple of years of, of starting. Um, so what it takes, what the opportunity is that you can put in a trail, you know, a lot of places have already these relationships with schools, um, you know, kids coming for field trips. You have instant STEM education. Um, you know, it can all be, it can be done on apps, it can be done on data sheets. Again, you can, you can actually do it with the pollinator garden. It doesn't even have to be a long trail, you know, a phenology monitoring site as opposed to a phenology trail. Lots of different ways that, that you can make it look. Um, but these nodes that actually establish then become the, the, the places where then the, the movement can proliferate, right? So the teachers come on a field trip, they learn how the trail works um, and the apps and all this stuff, and then they go back to their school and they build something similar. They tag maybe the same plants. Now you have this you know, comparison between the site and your location, these type of, of opportunities. Um, from the data perspective, you create a regional robust data set to track what's going on um, in, your, in your region. Um, you can create this army of citizen scientists um, in New York, which, which I think um, you know, New York is, is generally the, the big leader in lots of things. Why not in, in this? Um, build lots of new curriculum and resources. And then also experiment with what it takes to build networks. That's one of the most interesting kind of unexpected things about this project is that now we have the ability to look at the networks and see who is, who is producing the highest volume, highest quality data set and what does it take? So what is it about that organization and the way it's structured and organized? Um, I spoke to um, somebody, a, a, a nice woman from the Sierra Club earlier who, who said that, you know, that the, the, the way that, that the organization is um, structured has such an impact, and it's so true, right? So, so how do you then apply that to other fields and disciplines and projects? So lots of opportunity. This is just an example of some of the resources that have been built. This is a sort of a, a one-pager, a front and back, um, that you take out with you in the field. This is all on the New York Phenology Project website. Um, the resources are there you know, to basically start, start a project on your own. It's not something you, know, you need to 
to you know, spend a lot of money doing and all of that. There's a lot of resources to help you get started. Um, and you have a sheet, you, know, you can laminate it, um, put it on a little key ring and ha hang it in your office and that's what folks can use when they come out um, to, to actually check these various phenophases and match them to the tag plant to, to help them assess uh, what phenophase the plant is in. That's just one example. Um, I would say, I've been asked this question before, you know, so what are the, the traits of a good uh, monitoring site? And I think, you know, this is definitely not what it has to be. This is ju what, just some of the things that make it easy. So you have a site that already has trails. You already have a population of people who are coming to utilize the trail. Um, you have staff that are dedicated to monitoring themselves. That is an important one. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's never really a good idea to sort of launch a program and then just kind of hand it off and, and, and not have somebody who's also tracking it, who's, you know, committed and there on a pretty much a daily basis, not necessarily tracking every day, but you just are in touch with what's going on. That makes a huge difference. That the organization itself is really committed to this concept of civic ecology or uh, community science, whatever term you prefer. Um, and then schools or organizations with, uh, that have you know, this sort of field trip capacity if you're excited about and interested in this larger kind of outreach. Basically, to, to create an effective data set, really you just need folks out there two to three times a week, you know, whether it's staff or, or observers. Um, you know, you, when you have a group of people, what's great is that it tends, you end up then getting usually every day uh, tracking because if you have, let's say, 10 people and everyone's going out twice a week, generally you'll end up with a pretty consistent data set. Um, though, you know, you can end up with some weekend bias with, you know, people just coming out on the weekends. But for the most part, you can get a, a pretty nice data set. Um, having volunteer coordinators makes a difference. You know, having that sort of list or somebody who's managing that list or, you know, people and, and creating community events around it, potlucks. I mean, it's sort of, I've been asked this before about, you know, what makes a successful network. Um, and, you know, people expect these sort of complicated answers. And, you know, sometimes when I want to sum it up in wor one word, I say potlucks. Because this is, you know, the, just this idea of people coming together, having, uh, a, it's, it becomes a social um, activity. And, and it also improves the data quality because people are chatting with each other or going out together and saying, well, what do you think? Do you think this is actually unfolded? You know, that, and having dialogue about it. And that really makes a big difference. Um, for classrooms and those settings, you know, quality control measures, you know, for, for a classroom type of experience, I don't know how many folks here are teachers or work with students, but, you know, you're, the teacher can have a, an observer account. Uh, it doesn't have to be that all the students have to sign up as observers. But when you work with the students and you take them out into the field, you have them come to sort of a consensus with each other, you know, where they're estimating the number of the, plant, of the flowers that are open and they're, you know, making the decision if they think that phenophase is in, um, in full tilt or not. Um, and then, and then you're, you submit the data through your account, but they still feel like they really contributed and are entering data, and they are. So, so basically, how to participate in New York Phenology Project um, or, or any other project. I mean, it's not that this is the project, right? You can, Long Island can start its own. Um, it can be something you don't even hook in to a regional network. You can hook right into the national network. It doesn't have to be coordinated across the region. That's the kind of beauty about this as a tool, uh, is that um, you can really decide how you want to do it, um, either as a you know, small community or a regional community. Um, you can tag plants that are already in existence. Um, you can build. Um, it can be on a long trail, it can be in a garden, lots of different options. Um, when I ask the folks who, start, who establish these type of programs why they're participating, I'm trying to track what the motivation is to do this type of work. And, you know, for some it's the more research focused, you know, establishing uh, baseline data for, for species. Um, for some, it's, you know, looking at this, the compelling aspect is this urban to rural gradient design. Um, for some, 
It's uh, looking at this kind of different models of participation. That's one of the things that really motivates me. Um, and then for some, it's more of the outreach, the science, climate, literacy, um, you know, this nature self relationships. I mean, phenology is one of those, um, it's kind of a, a poetic science. I mean, it's almost a, um, has a, how dare I say this at a science conference, but like a spiritual component, you know, that's why the, the Zen monks are interested in doing it. It's a practice. It's not, it's not just science. It's actually building presence and attention um, and even, you know, discipline um, to, and, and results in this amazing connection with nature. I mean, before I started studying phenology, I knew the names of things, you know, that was my first sort of foray into being a naturalist was, you know, being able to walk out in the woods and know the name of everything I saw. And then it wasn't until I watched and the, my world became smaller, right? I was looking at small plots and trails not, you know, doing these massive inventories. And that is actually the first time I felt really like a, a naturalist, was watching through the season and getting to know these plants and pollinators um, in a way that, you know, the name sort of becomes irrelevant. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reasons to, to start these type of projects. Um, and uh, we've got a website, New York Phenology Project uh, .org. Um, so, you know, Facebook, blog, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is run through the Community Greenways Collaborative. Uh, so it's one of the uh, initiatives. So on the Community Cre Greenways uh, page as well, there's a lot of resources of lots of other citizen and community science projects that I've sort of culled that, that I, I, I think are really scalable and effective. Um, and possible to, you know, really implement in a good way across agencies in, in New York. Um, so I'll close there and uh, would be happy to take questions. Thanks. We do have time for questions. Just really quick, that was a really great talk. I, was, oh, I, I get excited about phenology, so I was dancing in my seat. Um, but you did mention a couple times about using specific data collection apps. Mm -hmm. Are there global apps like that that connect with the Nature of Phenology Network? Mm -hmm. Or are there specific other apps that you apply to the data collection? Mm -hmm. Good question. So the National Phenology Network, um, the, the data platform is called Nature's Notebook. Um, that is the app that you would download once you register an observer account. And again, remember too, I hope I, I, I didn't, fo I focus so much on the community and, and organization aspect of it. Any individual can do this in their yard. You can tag one plant in your yard. Um, you can actually contact them. They'll send you a cloned lilac. You plant it in your yard, you track that thing. So there's lots of, of opportunities to do it. But so Nature's Notebook has its own app that goes to one particular data set. There is also an organization called Project Budburst. It's kind of unfortunate that right now they are two separate platforms where those of us who are frustrated by that are, are working toward trying to get these data platforms um, to, to be cohesive. Um, but Project Budburst also is an alternative program that um, they actually deal more with schools. They have more of an education focus where Nature's Notebook or the National Phenology uh, Network has more of a, of a scientific focus. Um, but they both do pretty similar things. So they each have their own app. But then there are things like iNaturalist, which is a global app um, that does you know, it tracks phenology in the sense that you say that you saw this particular species, you know, and it records the, the date and location that you saw it. Um, but the, these phenology apps are, are much more specific. Um, another uh, organization to look at if you're interested in the education that's global is the GLOBE program. That's another one that, um, that has a lot of information out there if you're looking to incorporate phenology in, a, in an education um, capacity. But, but yeah, the Nature's Notebook app is super easy to use and easy to download and all that. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you.